I'm thrilled that some of you have taken the challenge and bit the bullet after years. I'm really speaking to those people who've been around for years and bit the bullet to try and do, learn a little bit of Greek. Now, what I'm doing here is just the very basics. So if we were to do more in-depth, in a different setting, I would do much more. I'd explain much more. Um, tonight, I'm going to do a little writing with you to show you, because I asked if they could put some lines on my tablet so I could show where the letters fit. <laughs> it's always important to know that, where the letters fit. Um, I'll explain a little bit about diphthongs and accents. But the main thing, I really, I thought about this. Um, different than learning Hebrew, or Hebrew, you must master everything every step of the way. Greek, I want this to be a little bit easier, and I'm going to almost tell you what I would recommend in fact, I'm just going to tell you the story. I was asked by a university, not the one that I graduated from, but another university to teach um, introduct an introduction to um, Hebrew and an introduction to Greek. And well, it's going to get messy here. I said, for the Greek, I, I can't. I couldn't for the Hebrew because I had too much going on. I was in the middle of doing my PhD program. I just, there's too much going on. But I can't do one for the Greek. And so the gentleman who was interfacing with me, he said, why? And I said, well, because the line of thinking for anyone who really wants to learn Greek is very different than Hebrew. Hebrew, you've got to have the minutiae right from the start. Greek, it's almost better to, to give the nuts and bolts and let people kind of navigate it themselves and then go back to the details. It almost works better that way. Um, <laughs> voice of experience is speaking. Uh, it almost works better that way. And so that's kind of what I want to do here. I don't want to get caught up. There, there are things that you need to know, like, dental pronunciation or labial pronunciation, things of that nature, but we're not necessarily engaging right now in speaking. We're going to be reading, and that, of course, engages the mouth, but I'm not going to be listening to you read in this forum, so it's a little bit different if we're sitting in a classroom setting and I'm going to be listening to you, then I can make the correction, but I can't hear you at home. So let's get going, and uh, kudos to whoever did this to my tablet. Now, these are letters that would fit. If you're looking at my tablet, you've got the perforated line there and the two thick lines in the middle. These are letters that would fit in the lower part. So if you're writing, and that is an A or alpha, uh, I'm, I'm Earnestly going to try and not do crazy things tonight because I know I've given you. I write one way at times uh, in my own writing. I need to be cognizant that I keep it the same as what I've presented to you. So we'll do it this way. Uh, I'm going to give you the E, the proper E, the way it should look as a small E. These are all letters that fit in the line. So you can see, and if I, if I dip a little bit below the line, it's not intentional. This is a, a thick pen to write with. What else am I writing here? So you can see what I'm doing. And I'm trying to be neat and proper, so 
it'll be extra sloppy. <laughs> All right, almost there. These are all the letters that would fit in the lower line if you were writing. So you can kind of get an idea as, a, as opposed to the letters that dip below the line when you write. So here we go. You can see what's dip, dip below already. Remember I was writing and sometimes I left tails on things. Well, now you can see why. Sometimes that might have a little tail on it, the M. Your Rho, the S, which curves down a little bit like that. And so you can see those are the letters that dip down below. Then there are the letters that extend above. Now, you know, when you're writing, if you're just putting the alphabet together as I did last week, you wouldn't necessarily notice it. But then when you see them like this, you start to see how their shapes may uh, be different from what you perceived as you wrote down the letters. So again here, and my letters may look a little strange, so forgive me. Uh, hmm. And also interesting at the same time. <laughs> All right, three that extend above the line. And then the next five letters I'm going to write uh, actually can at times appear to be at times, in, when I write, they will be all over the place, but they should be uh, kind of slightly below the lower line and uh, slightly through the middle. So something to the effect like this when you're writing. These are going to be strange looking here. That should have come down within the line, but here this one goes above the line and down. Oh boy, you're saying, wow. You don't have to master these necessarily as I'm doing them because I guarantee you I've probably butchered a bit here. This is just to show you how the letters would appear. If you were writing them out now, you can see that the top line, the letters are in the half space, starting from the middle and going down to the solid line. The second ones start at the middle and descend beyond the bottom line. That third line, delta, theta, lambda, these are pretty much filling the whole space. And the lower ones kind of have a combination somewhat. So that's what happens there. Now, let's take a new page. We'll save that. And <laughs> we have new lines. All right, we, we talked last week about rough and smooth breathing, long and short vowels, so I don't want to touch that. But I do want to talk about diphthongs, because the same thing that we have in English, that Greek has, and I will quickly write them out for you. I don't really think that you have to do anything like memorize or anything like that, but I will quickly write them out for you. There's not. Uh, that many, and I'll write out their equivalent. You'll see it's very self-explanatory. So starting at the top here, and I'll just kind of try and leave some space, and I'll write over the lines afterwards. You can already tell <laughs> I'm going to try and economize on space, and and I write bigger. Okay, so these are your diphthongs. Your, let me choose another color here. So we might equate this in English to a Y sound, like defy. We might equate this in English to the sound of 
the AI in weight, A. This we would kind of carry through to English the sound of the oi in boy, or just say oi, right? And then you're speaking two languages, Yiddish and Greek. <laughs> Who knew? All right. Uh, the equivalent here, as in wit, the equivalent here, as in plow, that, that would work. Um, this you should be familiar with. You, just you, right? You, so you is you. New, and I'm going to put a small e up here. And this, we'll say, is the equivalent to boot. Okay, so pretty simple. Um, and those are the, I think, the main ones. Um, other than that, I don't want to get caught up in too much. There's sub things here we could talk about, which I think I want to just skip over because they're, there are details we can come back to. My main goal is to get you to have a good grip on the alphabet, the rough and smooth breathing so you know what you're looking at because the, um, that can affect, obviously, pronunciation, um, and the diphthongs. There would be other things to look at, which, as I said, we could cover, but I probably um, the, the most important ones that I'm going to tell you right now, and you're going to be familiar with them, they are the combination sounds with the, with the letter gamma, gamma. And some, I'm sure some of you had a fine time trying to reproduce some of the terrible sounds I made while we were doing the lesson. All right, so what happens with and I know you're going to be familiar with some of these immediately. Combinations of two letters. No, oh, I didn't want to write in red, but it's too late. So let's flip this around, find blue. There we go. The combination of two gamma, gamma, two G, two G sounds, will produce something like our English anger. You're more familiar with it in the word angelos, angel. You've heard that before, an angel. So that is important to note. The next one, I might as well keep them looking the same, is this combination would represent our equivalent, the sound of banker or anchor. It's mm. That's why when you heard me pronounce gamma, I wasn't saying g with a hard. There's some, there's another sound in there. You're getting a little bit of it in these combinations. It's interesting. All right, you've got two more here. Um, but the most common one you're going to find is this gamma gamma combination. Say that five times. All right, this one, I don't know how many times I've seen this. Uh, not too many. The equivalent in English, hmm, you're going to like this one. Or better yet, Sphinx. Write English. Not sure what language that was going to be. So you can tell what that sound is. It, it's got a like it's it's going to be very I don't think there are many words with that um, to my knowledge um, trying to think I can't think of any off the top of my head Greek is very interesting you don't need a big pool of words um, you can bu start building a vocabulary. You'll find 
something very interesting. There are so many words repeated in the New Testament. For example, the word kai, which by the way, looks like that. It's got your AI in it, kai. Uh, it appears something like 9,130 sometimes. And if you think about it, I'm not quite sure how many words are in the New Testament, but that represents a small percentage of the total words you're going to encounter. So uh, it's really just mastering. There are certain words that are going to reoccur over and over again. You'll encounter them. Words like kai, de, ho, theos, uh, agape. Um, for example, the names Peter and Paul, Paulos and I want to say uh, Petros, but the two names occur almost the, I think, too shy of each other, the exact, in close proximity. Um, in the New Testament, apart from the mention of Jesu Cristo or Cristo, these two names reoccur all the time. So it's almost like once you begin to recognize these words and build a vocabulary, much different than Hebrew, where Hebrew kind of just morphs and changes, and you think you've, you know what the word is, and then it's some other word, or it has some other meaning. Greek is not like that. So it's almost like once you've built your foundation of words, you're well on your way. Do you need to memorize words as we get into doing a lesson on nouns, I'm going to give you some basic vocabulary. And I think it may not be tonight, but perhaps in the next lesson, I will give you the words that occur the most. We'll start building a vocabulary with the words that occur the most frequently. So you can just put them down, and you can kind of either jot them down. Kai can be and also. You, know, you can put the definition beside it. Or you can start looking it up in the Strong's for yourself, which I'm sure many of you have already done. So, um, OK, one more of these. I said there was one more, and there is one more in the this combination, which you'd say, wow, what on earth is that going to sound like? Can't even think. I'm going to give you my favorite word, lunkhead because it's got the, in English, unk. It's got that kind of strange combination sound. So that's what it may sound like. All right, I told you we're not gonna, I'm not gonna get into labials, dentals, and all that other stuff. That's just where the sounds are made, and eventually, if you wanna know about it, you'll just have to either look it up for yourself, or if I do a class, you'll have to sit through it and endure. Um, in Greek, the proper names are capitalized. Um, I'm trying to think of other things that will be helpful. For your purpose, if you get a Greek New Testament that has English, so an interlinear, if you have some that are um, straight Greek, like this is just Greek, uh, Nestle Allen. But if you've got one that has the interlinear English, a lot of times they will punctuate the Greek. But if you are familiar with the Greek in terms of historically, in the earlier papyri and manuscripts, we don't really have punctuation per se. You've got dots that will appear that in the majuscules, those large block letters, are telling us that that's the end of a thought or the end of a section or even the end of a sentence. But by and large, there are no punctuations. That comes later. And certainly, if something like this, you're going to have punctuation included because there's English beneath it. They're following along. All right, I'm not covering accents tonight either because that's something that it's like you're going to say, why do I need to know this? Well, if you were trying to speak or pronounce, it might be but I'm trying to give you the, the push to start pedaling on your own, right? So the quicker we get there, 
uh, the quicker you will navigate. I'm not going to talk about recessive accents or persistent accents like the one I have. All right, so introduction. See how fast that was painless. I just put you through. I just solved the, uh, we, we solved, we solved having to deal with a lot of those accents and things which you need to know them, but um, not now. Because I, I, I don't want you to go, wow, I'm hung up on the details because I'm, I want to get you into the noun. So let me take a new page and it's got nothing on it. So here, nouns. So Greek nouns have gender, number, gender, number, and case. Now, gender, we know, masculine and feminine in English included in the gender neutral, okay? And that's important. We're talking about the subject of the person of the Holy Spirit, for example, and we talk about the pneuma hagios, we're talking pneuma, the word itself, representing large S, capital S in the English, spirit. Neutral. And this is, you know, the thing that people hate when I do this, especially those people who are dogmatic about, you know, women and people in the church and whatnot. They hate that because the fact of the matter is if God's spirit, neutral, inhabits men and women, then it goes without saying that um, God can speak through a man or a woman. Uh, we, I just explained gender. Number is obviously um, you, you, same thing as we have in English. You've got singular or plural. And we'll deal with um, that as we get to it. You're going to find that understanding just the basics about nouns will help you to understand that when we put a noun and an adjective together, they must agree in gender, number, and case. So um, the gender and number are kind of easy peasy, okay? It's the case that usually gets people. Now, for people who have listened uh, any number of years, you're not, uh, you've heard this case referenced before. So what we have here when we get into the case system, and this is probably good review and introduction for some. In the case system, you have nominative. Did I do this right? I always mess this one up. Yep. Nominative case. This will carry through as well to verbs. So this is going to master this and you've kind of got this that will go widespread throughout the language. Um, I always use these little devices to help. So the nominative case is used as the subject of the sentence. Most people are not happy when it comes to grammar. So I always use these little helps, these little devices to help you remember, make it easier. So just think this way. When you hear a nominative case, think of, I nominate myself to be front and center, the subject of the conversation. Just think that, and you'll, it'll come to you that that's going to be related to the subject. Think of it as a self-serving, self-centered, <laughs> I nominate myself. And then you'll find, usually, those are the people that like to be at the middle of everything, right? Um, also can serve as the predicate nominative with linking verbs like am or when you wish to state the name of a thing. But the main thing is to, to get familiar with the fact that it usually is attached to the subject. Next one, you've heard all these before, so I know I'm not saying anything new. Genitive case. Now, we've got to be real careful about this. 
because there's a couple of ways that you can approach the genitive. We might use the English preposition of, um, but that almost becomes, that's a good place to start, but it is not always of. The best way to approach this is to say that, although I'm not talking about a part of speech necessarily, I'm going to say, this is not going to be helpful in terms of relating parts of the speech, but source, when you think genitive, think genesis, origin, right? Think of it that way. It's, this is a help. Um, so it can have two functions. The two functions would be to indicate motion away from um, or we might say out of. We'll do the grammar box in a minute. It'll be familiar. It'll all come back to if you don't remember the grammar box. We'll do it in a minute. No, it's not a dance. <laughs> do the grammar box. Do the grammar box. No? OK. No. <laughs> OK, then. Dative is used to show someone or something other than the subject or the direct object. So we might sometimes say we could use this to demonstrate or say the indirect object. That's possible. A lot of times the dative case, you'll find words by, with, sometimes even in, but I have to put that very carefully, in, and even at. And I said indirect, indirect object. Um, so let me go to the next one, and then we'll, we'll go to the box, because these are the main ones. Nominative, genitive, dative, and accusative. Now you've seen me do this before. I've done this as a help many times. The accusative always points away, right? So it is usually conveying motion toward, it can convey the idea of space or time. Um, and I'm going to leave that right there for a second. And underneath, put one footnote before I do anything else. We'll come back to the vocative. Let me take a new page. Let's do the box. Some of you probably have this box somewhere. Yes? Yeah, I figured so. All right. So. Let's do this. Accusative. I'm going to put the dative inside the box for a second. Sorry. And genitive. That is a good start. All right. Here we go. Accusative can be pointing this way. Genitive can be from or out of. Dative is always inside. Now you could probably put genitive at the front here, do the same thing backwards, and say genitive proceeding out of. So don't think that the order of where I've put them means anything, except for the dative. So dative is something that would be in. Think of how this appears. So genitive is what is moving out of as a source. Dative, what is, we'll call it underneath or within. And accusative is pointing towards. So it would be like this. Accusative is motion to or into. Motion to or into. If we're talking about motion and movement, motion to or into. Dative, 
on, in, or under, genitive, motion, away from, or out of, which brings me back to source. So that, let me go back to the page we were just at. So the only one that didn't appear there is the nominative case because it is the subject, it's clear and simple. That's the easiest. Now, I'm not giving you exhaustive, we could get into minutia of things because um, quite frankly, in each of these categories, in each of these cases, there are, well, we could probably fill hours or chapters um, just on disseminating the minutia of the nominative case. This is just a very generic, basic nuts and bolts. So anybody out there who's listening who has beyond the nuts and bolts, don't sit and say, well, uh, there's more to it than that. No, this is how you begin navigating. And um, then you can go back and you can deal with the complexities and the minutia. When I like to tell this story because it'll give you some encouragement. When Dr. Scott was alive, um, I could read Greek, but I had a large problem. I wasn't really familiar with what he was doing because I was familiar with modern spoken Greek. And, you know, what are the first things you learn in a foreign language? Don't say. So I taught him a lot of those words. I did. Um, but this, for New Testament study, um, I had to really work at it and kind of navigate my own way. It's not as though he sat down and said, let me explain it to you. While he was alive, I did, like most of you, just listen and take notes and watch. Um, but I had to navigate and kind of, um, it's almost like you've you got to figure it out for yourself, including the tools that you really need to use, the tools that are good opposed to the tools that are out there that you really don't need. So the reason why I'm putting this out there like this is this gives you the bits and pieces just to begin. So hypothetically, if you were going to try and now figure out a noun, and I need to find my place here. If you were trying to figure out a noun, gender and case, number and case, I've given you what you're going to be dealing with. And I said vocative. It's kind of strange. Evocative, you're not going to be um, dealing with that often. It's something that you deal directly with somebody. They don't occur that often in the New Testament. Um, John said to Mary. Something like that would be evocative. So I'm not really too concerned to explain it right now. But within the nouns, as well as verbs, you're going to encounter this if you have a textbook or if you're looking online, the word declension. So that is like what we, the, the word we use in another language, conjugation, to conjugate, except Greek uses declension. So nouns will be part of, just like verbs, you have to learn the declension. There is first declension of nouns, and then it goes first declension, second declension, um, and we'll have to kind of deal with those two categories. I think I'm going to do this now. First declension nouns, let's write this out, first declension nouns. Um, and don't think you have to get this all in one fell swoop. But I'm going to put here in brackets nominative 
and you got to pay attention to this. These are the in what would be the endings or long A. All right. Most nouns of the first declension end in either one of these two letters in the nominative singular. Long A will be found only in nouns whose stems end in, you gotta, this is where I said you got to pay a little attention here, in these three letters. Okay? So let's circle those. These three letters. All first declension nouns ending with these two letters are feminine. Okay? And so if you want to see what this looks like, I'll write it out for you. It's not something that I want you to fuss over you at home or going, ah, 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 <laughs> help. All right, I'm going to abbreviate now. This is nominative singular, so I don't have to keep writing it out. Genitive singular, dative singular, same thing all the way down. Accusative singular as well. And we'll put the vocative in here for good measure. All right, so here are what their endings technically would look like. And I'm giving you the, the letters. So you're going you're gonna to say, well, do I need to learn this right now? No, you don't. However, it will come in handy if you can steel yourself to recognize a few things. This is why I'm going through this awful exercise to write this out, because I want to point something out to you immediately that perhaps just may be helpful down the road. Put this long A like that. All right. So I want you to just take note of one thing that you could easily pass by and miss. These two lines under the dative singular. Why do I say you should take note of that? Why? Because when you start looking at words, you're going to, these are like little cheats. You're going to see these first and you're going to say dative. Now, there are other uh, accents that may appear under letters, but right now I want you to think I want you to err on the side of thinking that that's going to be a dative when you see it. Well, how do I identify the rest of the stuff? Well, bear with me because we'll, we'll do the same thing. This was the singular. And I'm going to try and figure out how I can do this. Let's put some blue here. Plural. Here we go. I'm going to write the plural. Uh, and you're going to say, huh? How'd that happen? Plural looks like, <laughs> plural looks like this. Uh, and you're probably saying it looks nothing like the first one. So how could that be? Well, this is why I said you just need to learn to recognize it. But I'm not asking you to memorize it, at least not now. Poor people that sat through Hebrew. <laughs> you got to memorize this. So there you have the plural, and that's just one part. Now, what does all of this mean? If you were to put, take one word, and well, now we're going to do what we did with the Hebrew, which is take something we call a paradigm. And we're going to use one word, and we're going to go through just the singular and the plural, and then this lesson will be done for tonight because some of you are feeling terribly tortured. I can sense it. All right. Who knew, right? And this is just the easy stuff. All right, so let's go with the, again, nominative singular. And we're, we're going to use the Greek word. Let me put it over here. We're going to use the Greek word. Um, Techne. 
all right, in the paradigm. So nominative singular is going to look, sorry, I just did this to you. That's the way I write my E's. I'm trying to be consistent with you to do it the way I showed you. And you'll have to forgive me. I have some, I have some habits that I do. Uh, I've developed over the years. So I'm going to try and break myself of for your sake so you don't get confused. So here, we have here as a subject and predicate nominative. That's number one. And you're going to say, what do I, how, do I, how do I distinguish from these other things? All right, genitive, singular. I'm not asking you to learn this right now. I'm just asking you to follow through and watch what happens. And I should have done this on the ending. It would have helped you much more to see this is your ending right there. Go back to blue. All right, genitive. Oh, you didn't see that, did you? <laughs> All right. I'm going to take the black. Here's your ending right there. All right? So again, here, you're looking at how this comes together in a paradigm. Dative. Again, singular. Probably I should have picked a word that's more common and more known to you. I want you to see what, at least tonight, you're going to say, I recognize that little line. Out of all the things you might forget tonight or might say, I'm totally confused, that little line is the telltale for the dative that you can recognize. You do see it, right? Of course. All right. I'm trying to convince you that you see it. You do see it, don't you? <laughs> all right. Almost done here, folks. Almost done. All right. Here's another ending for you. We'll do the vocative. We'll add this all in for good measure. Vocative. Again, I'm not sure that we'll end up using too much of that. And then if we were going into the plural without writing out the whole nature of this, I'm, and I'm going to just use one color now, but you'll see, well, I can't do that because it ruins your lesson. I just need to keep being consistent for your sake. I think, oh yeah, you'll see it. Uh, it'll be clear. But here's the plural. There's the plural for you. The same case. Now, genitive. Um, which should turn into there's an accent we didn't discuss that was part of a, a lump sum of things I said would come to later. Now you can see why I said I wanted to just introduce a few things to you tonight. And then you can say, it's all Greek to me. You see the endings I just gave you earlier, added on to a word, and now it's starting to look like something, not just. So this is declension. Greek declension of first declension of nouns. And the last we'll do here is the vocative. The vocative looks like this. And we're back to the ending that looks like that. So it's so all I want to do tonight is just show you this is an introduction to nouns. And the next lesson we do, I'm going to try and come up with words that you are maybe more familiar with. You've seen me or Dr. Scott Wright, so there's a little bit more um, identification that makes it flow a little bit better. You're not going to master, most people do not master declension in a day. This is just to show you what it looks like. And we're only talking about first declension. Second declension nouns is a different category. Um, the only thing I want to tell you with all this is I just told you about nouns, and then there's some other sidebar, which is 
in the Greek if we were trying to take a noun now and put it in a sentence structure. There does not exist. You cannot find it. It's not there. There, there is no indefinite article in the Greek, only a definite article. So when we come to put nouns into a form, you're only going to know that it is definite by the fact that there will be a definite article and lack thereof will indicate that it is indefinite. That's about all I want to talk about nouns. Declension, which is a good introduction, and some people are going, oh God, what is this over? Yes, it's over now. You can come out of the closet. <laughs> okay. Uh, I guarantee you that I will try and plan the next lesson so it's a little bit easier, um, easier in the respect of trying to find some better devices for you to master the declension, at least the first declension. And um, perhaps the most important thing to note is that um, if you didn't know any of this, and I were beginning to put together a sentence, um, we'll eventually get into the structure, the syntax, the structure of sentences, of Greek sentences. We'll, we'll have to talk a little bit in detail about the article because the article gets a lot of people confused. And then really the big, you know, bombs away is once you get into the verbs. And that is not, I don't want you to think of this as what I'm doing here as I'm going to go and do 20 lessons here in this forum. I'm just introducing the nuts and bolts, as I said, probably for the fifth time tonight. Because once you understand declension of the nouns and we get into declension of the verbs, you can begin, and I give you the way things are ordered in the Greek, you can begin to almost put things together um, yourself. And I, I like to say, stumble around a little bit in the language and explore it yourself, and then we come back, and those who are interested in going a little bit deeper, um, they'll get the pieces that they need. I don't want to tax people who are not inclined to go beyond just the basics of what they actually need to pick up, uh, you know, you got your Strong's, mine's at the back of my Bible, and both Hebrew and Greek, and luckily, for example, You've, in Strong's, you've got the Greek, you've got the English, you've got the phonetic, um, how to pronounce it, and so forth. So you're not left to your own devices. However, if you're actually trying to find a word and you were using some other tool, in which I would like to, just like I did with Hebrew and I introduced the tools of Hebrew, I'll introduce some Greek tools which are probably far superior, superior to use um, than the strong. Strong's is helpful as a starting point, but if you're wanting to dig and get a little bit more depth, Strong's is not going to do anything except lead you down a trail, maybe back to a couple of words back there, two back, three back, go to 707 from the root of 63, and that's all you're going to get. So I want to be able to give you the tools as well because the whole point of this is to enable you to do some of your own studies on your own and for some who are inclined to, you know, even in a lot of the studies that Dr. Scott did where he used either Hebrew or Greek, these tools come in very, uh, I think, very important to be able to follow along, not just watching somebody write but actually connecting with what's actually being said or, or put on the blackboard or whatever it is that's happening. So. These are all important tools. Now, that's all I'm going to do tonight. So hopefully I didn't kill some of you at home. And if I did, oh well. Uh, <laughs> say hi to Jesus for me.